Okay, gentlemen, we're live. Very good. Scott is making a little adjustment there, I believe. And he'll be right back with us. So if anybody's already viewing, hello, everybody. Uh, glad you're on. We're going to actually officially start at 10 o'clock. Scott's making a couple of adjustments, which I don't blame him at all. Uh, I rolled in here a while ago and I told <laughs> Scott and Ben, if I don't get a cup of coffee, they might as well not turn this camera on today. So I well, do I, have my my cup of coffee here. I Scott, got up, how are you doing? Just fine. I just got up to um, close the shade and I closed the wrong one. So we'll see what happens here. <laughs> well, you look good, my friend. You look good. I can see you just fine. So hopefully all, right. all our viewers can too. So it's, uh, it's a little bit before our official start time. As always, Ben is eager to get the ball rolling. And we have people uh, that continue to click on during the broadcast. We actually had some some early birds today, believe it or not. So we've we've got a dozen or folk, a uh, dozen or so folks already uh, peeking over our shoulder, which is fine. We welcome them. And I, I've talked to a lot of folks in the industry who say, you know, I get on here and um, I, I I I can't stay for the whole thing. I've got to jump off. And I always remind folks we record them. And uh, some somebody Scott came up to me in Vegas, and uh, and just basically said, "Hey, I watch your watch your webinars. They look good. Keep them going." And and so that was fantastic. So I have no idea who it was, but uh, very nice, kind words. So whether you agree with us or not, whether you want to challenge us or not, hey, we welcome that too. So if anybody's uh, already tuned in and, and peeking at us, uh, if you've got a different perspective or a different point of view. And you would like to sit in, uh, in the hot seat, we'll call it. You're certainly welcome to do that. Just reach out to Ben or Doug or Hal or myself, and uh, we'll give you a platform. Um, what's going on, Scott? I know you just got back from Vegas, as did I. It was good to see you there. Well, I, I had a great time there. I um, listened to a lot of good presentations, and I look forward to the spring. I think we're going to be in Salt Lake City, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, we had... Uh, uh, so what we're talking about, folks, if you're if you're chiming in, we were I bumped into Scott out in Las Vegas at the Appraisal Summit and Expo. Uh, and now the next conference the National Association of Appraisers is uh, putting on is in uh, Salt Lake City in April. And I may not be exact on those dates, but I think it starts around April the 9th. So uh, viewers, you'll be you'll be getting more information on that. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we got to see each other and, and what was really, <laughs> what was really fascinating. I spoke on adjustments, you know, my, my, uh, my little section was, uh, I was speaking on adjustments and utilizing recognized techniques as opposed to the old way of just guessing. <laughs> right. Um, and, and after my presentation, I, I mean, I think it was, it may have even been the next day. A gentleman stopped me uh, on a break. He said, hey, come here. Can you go over that one technique that you did? And Scott, he happened to be sitting right next to you. <laughs> and, and that was a, a gentleman out of Indiana. He joined the NAA that day. And, um, and he was asking me. He was a, a, you know, an excitable guy and wanted to learn. And he said, I do this already, but, but I, now I can show it to my partner. Can you go over it again? And, and I did. And then I said, hey, it just just so happens you're sitting by the guru here, Mr. Scott Cullen. And uh, so I got you got to spend a little time with him. And go yes, I did. And um, and he got home and he signed up for our 14 day demo and right. uh, he, he used it on a few reports and called. We talked yesterday, maybe for a half hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. And, um, and that's the part that that I neglected at the beginning was encouraging people once they've got it up on their screen. Give me a call. Um, it's like a house. It's been remodeled many times. And right. uh, because I'm the one that's doing the remodeling, I think everybody <laughs> understands exactly what's going on, yeah. which isn't true. So uh, if you're using it, give me a call. Um, we, we learn by the questions that we get for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and we're we're going to get into this more and more uh, when when our webinar officially starts. We've we've got probably fifty people on already, but uh, uh, we we'll start in three minutes. So hang tight, everybody. We're just kind of having a little chit chat, a little conversation. So you were in Vegas. You mentioned Salt Lake. So you are definitely going to be in Salt Lake City. In I, I plan to be there. That reminds me of like 1973, before a lot of you were born. I went on my first ski trip in the mountains. Uh -huh. And growing up in Minnesota, I loved to ski, but our hills are only like 300 feet high. 
Right, right. A real treat to drive out there with a couple of my friends. And, right. And we had a, um, a lady uh, who was a student at University of Utah at the time that was our tour guide. And she knew all the right places to go. And we had just a wonderful time for a week. Uh, but that was, you know, a long time ago, 1973. Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful out there. I've only been a few times. Uh, last year, I got to go with a lady I'm dating. She went for a medical conference and and I got to hang out. Uh, but I, I actually went out there for training many years ago. And I've, I've taught out there before, but I, I haven't gotten to see much of it. So I'm hoping... I'm hoping actually to to take a day or two uh, uh, stay extra. I'd, I'd like to do a little bit of hunting while I'm out there. Sure. Uh, ben, ben just put up for those of watching that might be interested. Uh, we're talking about what's called the ACTS Conference, A-C-T-S. It's the Appraiser Conference and Trade Show. And that conference is going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, April the 7th through the 10th. And the conference itself will last a couple of days, but there's a welcome reception. The NAA will have a meeting. They'll have a board of directors meeting. And, and if you've never been to a conference, I highly encourage you to go. We, we just, Scott and I both just got back from Vegas. Jim Park was there. John Brennan was there. Julie Jones from Fannie Mae was there. Uh, just a whole, we had a, a Jeff Jensen from the FBI was there, which was pretty cool. Craig Capella from Illinois, a, a practicing attorney that helps appraisers to try and get out of trouble. If you are in trouble, uh, he was there lecturing, uh, talking about things to do to protect yourself as a practitioner. Uh, we, we, we had a great group of folks there and, you know, how often as a practicing appraiser, can you walk right up and have a conversation with someone from Fannie Mae? Have you ever had that opportunity? Uh, VA was there. And so if you've never been to a conference, I highly recommend you think about going. We're excited about the Axe Conference in Salt Lake City. And a lot of the folks there in Salt Lake uh, and Utah in general are coming on board. They're excited to be participants and get going. Scott, it's 10 o'clock, so we got to get right. going, buddy. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Reynolds. This is the Appraisal Report webinar. We're excited that you're here. This is sponsored by Appraiser eLearning. We have this webinar. It's free, so the price is right for you. We have it the fourth Thursday of every month, starting at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Don't worry if you've got to get off, if something happens, if you got to take a phone call, we record these events and they're pretty much available at the conclusion of the live webinar. You can get right back on and see the recorded version. What we'd like for you to do right now, just right now, while, uh, while I tell you to, and it's at the top of your mind, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Appraiser eLearning, you'll continue to be in the know. You'll get notifications. And guys, we do special editions. We've got a special edition coming up, I think in November. You're not going to want to miss it. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm not going to tell you who they're with but you're not going to want to miss it. It's big, 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 big news. A lot of changes are coming in our industry. You will want to see that special edition webinar. So go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then you'll know when that's happening. Hey guys, I'm honored and excited about our guest today. Um, he's been on a couple of times and uh, he does a great job. He's got a lot of knowledge. Um, he's got some some uh, software product that he can tell you about as well. Uh, Mr. Scott Cullen, thank you again for being here. And tell everybody who you are and what is it that you do, my friend. Well, I'm a residential appraiser up in Egan, Minnesota, which is a suburb just south of St. Paul. It's kind of a second ring suburb. And I've been appraising for 19 years. And about three years ago, a friend and I started a software company that automates uh, the depreciated cost methods. So I'd say right now I'm about 50% looking at houses and doing appraisals. And the other half of the time talking to appraisers on the phone who use our software. Great. And, and I want to remind our viewers, you know, this isn't necessarily a commercial for Scott software, but if you do want information, Scott, how can they get in touch with you if, uh, if they want to check out your product? Well, there's a website, solomonappraisal.com. That's all one word. Or uh, my email is s-c-u-l-l-e-n-2 at comcast.net. Great. Thank and you very that, much. And that's all on a slide when we get, we're going to do a little bit of a PowerPoint slide here 
to keep track of some numbers, but it'll be uh, shown on there as well. And so the subject matter today is is land value, crazy land values, I believe, Ben called this or you called this. And, and we're going to dive into the subject matter here. And again, you know, whether they use your software or whether they use a recognized tech on their technique on their own, uh, I think you're going to be able to walk away with some good, useful information. So I'm glad that uh, the viewers are on. I'm glad you're excited to be here. I would like to remind you that you have the ability to participate. This isn't scripted. That's one thing I love about the appraisal report webinar. We don't prepare, you know, a script and go over it for months at a time or weeks at a time. Uh, this is just a conversation. It's a conversation uh, amongst some experts and uh, and it's real time. So sometimes you can see some bloopers. Please don't hold that against us. <laughs> uh, but as a consequence, we also allow you to ask questions in real time. And we get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. So don't be afraid to participate. We want your participation. Feel free to type in a question. We'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. So we're going to just dive right into the subject matter. And we're going to talk about land value. Now, Scott, if you're doing an appraisal and the, the subject of the appraisal is developing an opinion of land, I mean, that's, that's pretty easy. You know, I'm I'm appraising a farm for someone or I'm appraising someone's lot they've got for sale. Okay. Sure. But, but I think we're, we're talking more in line with you're doing an appraisal of a house, let's right. say for a refinance or, or maybe even a purchase. Um, do I even need to deal with, with trying to figure out what the land value is? I mean, at the end of the day, the bank really just wants to know what the property as a whole, right? The, the house, the land, the driveway, the barn, the garage, whatever I've got on this property, the land and its improvements as one economic unit. That's my job. That's my job to report an opinion, a credible opinion of value as, as a whole. Uh, why do I need to even care about developing an opinion of the land value? Well, if you're doing a condo, of course, you do not need to know the land value. Okay. Okay. If you're doing a 1004 um, and you start on page one in the site section, they'll ask a question, what is the highest and best use? Now, you do need a land value um, to support a highest and best use. I think most people would agree. Um, at the bottom of page one, there's another question that says to report the effective age. Now, effective age is really an assertion about the depreciation that you've observed. And uh, depreciation is, you know, effective age divided by economic life is the percentage of depreciation. Uh, and to get the depreciation, you really need to have the land value because that's a component of the total. Um, so we can't measure depreciation. We can guess at it, but we can guess wrong, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the third thing, um, we also need to state on page three, the remaining economic life. And that comes straight from economic life and effective age. It's just subtracting. So that's why we need, an, an uh, I guess it's going backwards in the logic, we need an accurate effective age to have that. We need an accurate depreciation to, to get that. We need land. Um, the, the third reason I would say is that even if the client doesn't require the cost approach, it's nice to have in your work file to support the things you report, you know, like highest and best use that we just talked about. Um, and as you know, I advocate using depreciated cost to either corroborate or actually develop adjustments for the grid, which, um, uh, I think it's the fastest way. That's a, a different topic for a different time. Um, and the last thing, I guess, um, I did a review yesterday on a 2006 form. And one of the questions they asked was to verify the land to improvement ratio. Mm. So if you're doing a review that has a cost approach, um, you need to answer that question. Sure. And, and you know, if we, if we talk about the analysis aspect, 
I mean, right there on the sales comparison grid, there's a line item for lot or land. And, you know, you're going to make an adjustment for the differences Correct. from whatever the site size of comp one is versus your subjects. I mean, right. you're kind of in the dark if you don't, unless you find, you know, all sales that are the exact same size or, or contribute the same as your subject properties land. So right. yeah, there's, there's definitely some issues there. So now that we've talked about uh, why I need this, this crazy land value, uh, what, how do we do that? I mean, I, I think there, there's six different recognized techniques for de developing an opinion of land value. And I remember that, and sometimes I forget, but it was funny. There was a gentleman uh, in one of my classes and, and he had served on a board one time and uh, he's taken several of my classes. And I, I always, I always have him tell this story and he's not embarrassed to do so. He, he, he does so. He said, I had a job. He said, it was in the, I was in the running with one other appraiser for this very high position at a very big firm. And uh, he said, you know, forget a hundred thousand. He said, this was a couple hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year job. This was a big job for him. And, and he said, I went through a couple of interviews, everything went great. And uh, he said, Brian, I was, uh, he said, I know I was down, it was between me and another candidate. And he said, I was actually mowing my lawn one morning and my phone rang. And I recognized that, oh gosh, this is a company I'm trying to get this job with. So I shut off the mower, right? Shut off the lawnmower and answered the phone. And the gentleman says, yeah, I, I uh, was calling about your uh, inquiry in this job. And, and I just have one question for you. And he said, yeah, yeah. What can I help you with? He said, what are the six different ways of uh, developing an opinion of land value? <laughs> and he, he's like, oh, my God. And he's on the phone and he's he's guessing, you know, he, he said, I just didn't know. He said, I just did not know the answer. And he said, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't recite all si six different techniques off off the cuff here. I, I apologize. And and the other, the gentleman on the other end of the line said, okay, well, thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. And this, this guy is telling me, and I don't know if this is true, but he's telling me, he said, I'm quite convinced that's why I didn't get this job. So, right. you know, we've got the sales comparison. We got allocation. We got extraction. We got land residual uh, income and we've got subdivision development. Okay. Uh, so there, there's six different ways. Uh, I don't think we're going to go through all six of those today. I know you've got a couple you want to chime in and, and talk about that works well for you, that uh, you can demonstrate uh, how appraisers out there watching can can utilize a similar technique uh, in their own practices. Hmm. You know, the sales comparison is kind of the easy one, right? I mean, if we're if we're doing something out in the county and and we've got an array of of comparable units, we you know we all know how to do that. I think. Uh, what are some of the other techniques that you use on a regular basis that you want to go over with us today that maybe maybe some of the appraisers out there watching are a little uh, rusty on or dusty on? Okay. Well, I, I think to do that, to put it in context, I'd like to try to run that uh, PowerPoint. So okay. if, if Ben Great. can help me if I'm doing this wrong. Yeah, sure. So you're and, going to hit the screen share option, Scott. Yep. And then choose the application window and then pick the application itself. So are we on? We're on. By okay. the way, I, I always think of Ben as like the Wizard of Oz, you know, that, <laughs> that just that voice comes on, you know, avoid the man behind the curtain. And we don't see his face, we just see that that pulse on the screen. So it's almost like the, the wizard, Ben the wizard. Right, well, so, I'm in Egan and Brian's in Kentucky and Ben's in Nashville and everybody else is everywhere else. And it, to me, it's a miracle that, that this actually can happen. Absolutely. But, um, All right, Scott, take it away, Scott. Well, the topic, crazy land values, I, for a long time, had no idea how fast land values change. It, it's Land is volatile. Um, so crazy land values is a title. And what I want to do is go back in history to October 1st, 2013. Uh, the case Schiller Index was at 170. And what that means is that th their base year is 2000. So the average house in the USA costs 70% more than it did in, in the year 2000. Um, they publish it every year, every month, every quarter, I think. October 1st, 2017, it was up to 197. So there's a 16% change in values for houses. Um, so let's go back to October 2013. 
and let's say that we've got a $250,000 house and, and the land to value ratio, that's one of the ways, that's the allocation method, right? The land to value ratio was 20%. So that house had a $50,000 lot and the building was worth $200,000, okay? So again, 250 for the value, 200 for the building, 50 for the site. Now that same interval, the reason I picked that interval is because that same interval, according to national building cost, which is the, the cost data that I license from my software, um, they show no change in price or no change in cost for materials and labor to build the house in that same interval. So what happened uh, in uh, 2017, that house would have now been worth 290. That's 16% more than the 250. The building is unchanged. So now the site value is $90,000. Um, and I don't think I noticed that for many, many years, how fast the land values change. And I guess that's why banks don't like to lend on land. It's a very volatile commodity. So next slide. Um, so the increase of 16% in values uh, during a period when cost was unchanged, or even if cost was at a different rate, infers that the increase in, in value is due to the site change. It's a site value game all the way. Um, so 90% is 80%, there was an 80% gain in the land value using our example from 50 to 90. So the question is, how do we keep track of the site values, I think? Uh, one way that we talked about is comparable site sales. Um, that'll show you. Um, and if, remember, if you go back to like 2008, when the builders had all gone out of business and the banks were holding the land, and they were trying to sell it to other builders and nobody wanted them, site values just plummeted, which kind of is in step with, uh, with our thinking here. Everybody probably saw that. Um, another way to do it is um, if there's no land values, no site sales, I should say, is allocation. That's a quick way to do it. Um, so now the question is, do we use the historical 20%? which would make the land worth 20% um, of 290? Or do we use 31%? Because we already showed that the land is actually 90 out of 290. So the allocation method can vary quite a bit because again, we're not, just, we're not keeping track of land, we're just applying a rule of thumb. So my approach to it and where I noticed it was doing market extraction. Um, Market extraction is just the cost approach done backwards. Instead of solving for um, a value, we're, we're starting with a value and solving for the land. So, so that's where uh, my interest was peaked in, um, in having a, a simple way to do extraction. Um, yeah, and, and Scott, I think a lot of appraisers are challenged with this because we all know how to do a sales comparison approach. Uh, we get three, uh, vacant lot sales or four or five or six, whatever. Uh, we put them all in a grid and we, we uh, put topography down. We put uh, the comp number one had four trees and my subject only has three <laughs> trees. So there'd be an adjustment for that, right? Isn't that, isn't that how all of you do that, right? You make an adjustment for a tree. Uh, you make an adjustment for a fence or for sloped or what have you. you know, in all honesty, most appraisers do a qualitative analysis when they're doing a, a comparable uh, land sales to help develop their opinion of, of site value, which is perfectly fine. I'd like for appraisers to, to think about that technique. You know, how do you get your land value when you do have an array of comparable sales? You do that in a qualitative manner. You know, you can actually do your improved sales in a qualitative manner too. And we may be, we may be moving to that. I don't know. We'll see. But, if there aren't comparable sales, if, uh, if I'm appraising a property in a subdivision and there are no vacant lots in that subdivision, how am I getting that opinion of land value? And I think you're gonna be getting into some extraction here. Right, I'm gonna try to change gears here now, Ben, if I could, and share a different screen. Let's see. How do I how do I share? There we go. A different application. So you'll hit the screen share button, the green arrow, and then you'll okay. select the application window and then choose the specific application you want to show and then hit share. Okay. 
and I don't see my application up here anymore. Um, how do I get a browser on here? Uh, just open up a new browser and- Oh, here we go. Now, now do you see it? You gotta do the screen share. Yeah. Okay, are we okay? I see it. All right, so we've this is a, um, a worksheet within our software application, and you can do this in Excel. Um, all this was is me and appraiser using Excel and turning it over to a programmer who put it on um, on a server so people can log in and we can charge them. Uh, we charge fifteen dollars a month. So here's here's an example. Let's say that you've got a two hundred and fifty thousand dollars sale. I'll use my zip code. Whoops. And it's a quality four. We've got eleven quality rankings here. A four is uh, pretty standard up here. It's 1,200 square feet. It has central air. There's a 1,200 foot basement. We're big on basements in Minnesota. We finish them, 1,000 square feet. We have a bathroom in our basements. And there's usually a fireplace because it's cold up here. Um, let's say that there's a deck of uh, 240 feet and a garage of uh, 440 square feet. So that's the house. And we don't get into a lot of detail because remember, we're doing this for a comparable property that has a site that we want to extract the value of. We haven't been in the house. We haven't looked at every little nook and cranny. This is kind of a streamlined cost approach. It'll get you close. Okay. Um, site value improvements, let's just assume $5,000. Now, this, now is, this is, when you say site improvements, that would be your as-is depreciated site improvements. Right, that, is that that's right? a really okay. important thing. Uh, I used okay. to uh, do a cost approach on the horse barn and then use a depreciation. And then I found out that, well, wait, that's just a site improvement. <laughs> or it can be considered a site improvement. So all we need to know is that the, the horse barn adds $10,000, okay? But let's say it's a normal house in a subdivision, $5,000. It might be 10, but we'll get into that in a minute. The, the real, um, for the appraiser's experience, you know, we talked about that down in, uh, uh, in Las Vegas. Never say that I'm basing my adjustments on my years of experience. But, <laughs> yeah. but here's what you can say, and this is right out of logic literature. You can say, I base my adjustment or my judgments are based on inductive reasoning. And then if they say, what's inductive reasoning? You say, well, that's my years of experience. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but anyway, let's assume that we've got a 20-year-old house and it's average. So we'll say 20 as an effective age just for starters. This is a way to look at trade-offs. So now when I click calculate, all of this is going to translate into a site value. So that site is worth $75,000. Now, if the house actually sold for 60, 260, What's going to happen? This is going to go up ten thousand dollars, right? And if the site improvements were actually fifteen, let's say, like when I'm doing a house that's got well and septic, it's probably ten thousand dollars worth of well and septic, but then the lot is worth less because the city lot didn't need that improvement. So now they're back to seventy-five again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, and there again, the real kicker is this one: the depreciation. If you change that to fifteen. Now what we're going to have in this whole equation is less, um, uh, we're going to have more expense in the house because there's less depreciation. And that means we'll have less in the site. Okay, so that's all it is. It's just a way to look at all the trade-offs. Gotcha. Um, Scott, on that page right there, I, I've, yep. I've got a couple of questions. On that page sure. right there, you're you're manipulating that effective date, which is a judgment call. I'm, I'm right. fine with that. What What is this? Uh, there must be something keyed in there for your uh, total economic life. Uh, well, the uh, and I, I heard you explain how to derive that mm -hmm. uh, down in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that I do it, because I'm licensing data from national building cost, mm -hmm. they actually publish in their cost manual we assume a Q4 has 60 years of life. Okay, so that's coming from it's, the national it's from the cost, cost yeah, service. So okay, the, I'm fine. Ask, that's fine. Yeah, if somebody asks you, well, it's a, a Q3, for instance, now this is going to go a little bit crazy. A Q3, according to them, has 70 years of economic life. Okay. So now we've got a minus 16 on site value, which is impossible. Right. Um, that's because those things usually sell for more like 360 maybe. So anyway, this will let you do the trade-offs and, and try to see, try to get the balance, again, using your inductive reasoning, all that you know, 
coming down to this particular assignment, here's my best judgment on the site value. And, and that's a way to support, if you wanna do this three times for each of the comps, then you can see, well, this site is 83, that one's 93, there's a $10,000 difference. There's maybe the basis uh -huh. for an adjustment. Yeah, what would be interesting is if you did that in a subdivision, like uh, I, I, I always default back to thoroughbred acres here where I right, live. Right, sure. Okay. So, Let's do thoroughbred acres. What are those sell for? So, so yeah, thoroughbred acres. Well, heck, I don't know. Now, see, you're catching me off guard. <laughs> but but uh, I can uh, maybe pull it up. Let me see. Um so thoroughbred acres is a is a subdivision here in in owensboro where i live and these houses were built oh i don't know in the 80s or, or late 70s maybe some of them and it's it's just a great little neighborhood and uh, we have a lot of alike properties in there so i guess my my point is if we wanted to we could go through and do an analysis on every gulf stream model in that subdivision if we wanted to sure and try and get some some indication um and and I don't want to be accused of doing an appraisal live on a webinar <laughs> right now. So those so, were fifteen hundred square feet, right? Yeah, I'd have to charge all our viewers a fee if I did that. So and there's so, no basement. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, Scott, here's a question from uh, one of our viewers, Michael. Michael asked, "Does this method include developer profit?" Uh, I thought NBC did not include this. So he's looking for entrepreneurial incentive. In right. Yep. Um, I would say I don't believe so. I know that they include the cost of a subcontractor's overhead and profit. Um, a, a, a builder building a one-off house would have his profit included. But if you get into a Lennar development um, where they've got all these economies of scale, they also have quite a bit of profit built in as a developer. So... I think it depends on on which pro which product it is, uh, or which kind of what kind of house it is. But in general, they would include the builder's normal profit, um, but not a developer's if they're if they're distinct. Okay, and Scott, on the screen that I'm still looking at here, you said basically as I change the quality level, that third right. box up there it's going to change the total economic life on each one of those ratings, I guess, right? So well, actually they use um, 70 years for a Q3, a Q2 and a Q1. Okay. And they use 60 years for a Q4 and a Q5. And for a Q6, they use 55. So okay. our, our calculator includes that, but there's a little difference. Um, uh, they're not all the same. Sure, sure. Is that possible to manipulate that if I if I wanted to actually go in or would I just have to call you and say, hey, I, I, in my market, I'm seeing not 60 years, I'm seeing 80 years. Right. Uh, is that something that could be manipulated or would, would I just need to call you and see if we could get your programmer to manipulate well, that? Well, um, I don't want to do that because I want to just take the cost data as a whole. And if they're saying that it costs this much to build a house, um, with this level of materials, it's designed for 60 years. I got you. Now, now there are components in the house that have different lives. For instance, mm -hmm. a deck only is supposed to last 20 years. The foundation or the framing might last 80 years. The decorating might last 10 years. But you roll all those together, and they just use a number of 60. So I got you. I got we, you. we can't handle The other thing that we can't do, and this was a business decision, we can't mix qualities within a house. We can't right. give you a Q5 garage with a Q3 house, even if that's what's sitting on the lot. Sure, sure. And that, that kind of lines up with UAD. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Very good. Well, Scott, we're uh, we're almost at the halfway mark, and I am going to just real quick, uh, not necessarily. Uh, I guess I am going to plug working real estate, <laughs> which I didn't mean to. Okay. But the reason I'm putting this up is I see your name. Uh, I see your name in here. And actually, they mentioned you on the first page there. And you've got a really nice article written and published in the uh, live print version of Working RE. So tell us a little bit about the uh, the article you wrote. Well, it, it's the same thing that we're talking about. It's the risk of land volatility. Now, Working RE, of course, insures people um, against uh, lawsuits or loss. 
And a, a good way to get into trouble is to mislead a client about the land value on certain types of assignments. Um, and I'm, I'm using the same uh, logic here. We're showing what happens not only when land goes up, but when land, or excuse me, when housing prices go up, it's, be, it's usually because of the land. And when they drop, it's also because of the land. So uh, again, banks want to know what they're lending against. And, and I, I think it's, it was really important for me to see that when the market crashed, that, that land uh, just dropped significantly, at least in my market. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, well, again, I want to remind everyone, we are at the halfway mark. My name is Brian Reynolds. This is the Appraisal Report webinar. We're thankful that you're here. If you have a suggestion of a topic you'd like to see in the future, or if you know someone that would be a good guest for us, please drop us a line to let us know. Or if you would like to be on the webinar, reach out to us. We'd be happy to have you. Uh, I would like to also remind everyone this is being brought to you by Appraiser eLearning. And all of these are being recorded. So if you have to hop off during the broadcast, you can come back on and see the duration on a recorded uh, webinar at a later time. In fact, we have a lot of these uh, that have been recorded over the last year. So go check some of those out. We've had some exciting guests and very thankful that uh, the guests are willing to participate on this live broadcast because you never know what's going to happen when it's live. <laughs> also, we would like to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you will continue to be on the know uh, as these webinars unfold. Typically, typically it's the fourth Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Now, I'm just going to tell you, uh, I believe next month, or in, excuse me, in November, that would be on Thanksgiving Day. So we probably won't be broadcasting on Thanksgiving Day. We will tweak that as, as well as tweaking probably around Christmas time. So we may adjust or massage that date a little bit, but typically it's the fourth Thursday of every month. We'd love to have you uh, here. We've got a couple other questions, and, and I'm, I've got some questions for you as well, Scott, but let's, uh, let's look over at the board. Tim is asking a question. Is it true that the quantity of entrepreneurial profit is one sign of the health of the general economy? Ooh, he's asking you some economic questions there. I would say yes. <laughs> yeah, I would um, agree. I think if there's um, um, increasing wages or increasing employment levels, um, certainly in a local economy, I've seen cases where a new bridge went in across a river. And those condos used to be 150. And when the bridge opened, they were 200 because it was a short commute to the job center. So I would say absolutely, uh, builders can, uh, they'll, they'll have land in the bank. They've bought land many, many years ago and they're waiting for the time to develop it, right? Uh, we have another question here, uh, Scott, and we may have we may have pretty much covered this one, but I'll, I'll let you uh, reiterate if you'd like. Why does an appraiser need to know site value if they don't do the cost approach? Okay, um, I think it goes back to first of all, uh, USPAP states that we are to be aware of and able to correctly apply recognized methods. Okay, so land value is um, a part of the 1004, whether you report it or not, it should be in your work file because a site value will support things that have to be in your report. For instance, um, highest and best use. It's hard to develop an opinion of highest and best use without knowing what the land is worth. Um, uh, we're supposed to talk about effective age in our report, even if we're not doing the cost approach. And effective age has to be developed. You can either guess, or you can develop it from knowing site value and cost to get to depreciation because effective age is, uh, you know, effective age divided by economic life is the percentage of depreciation. So same thing with remaining economic life. We need to know effective age to get remaining economic life. So if you do reviews, I did one yesterday, it had the cost approach. And then one of the questions was, is the cost approach um, or is the land to value ratio uh, correct? So I needed to develop an opinion of that or, or give my opinion of that. So even though we're not reporting it, I think it's part of a solid work file and it, it gives you the confidence that you've got a coherent report that's not contradicting itself from one page to the next. 
Yeah, no question about it. And 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 on top of that, a lot of the clients ask for remaining economic life. They ask for an opinion of site value, et cetera. So, I mean, you're, you're going to be dealing with that nonetheless. Um, when we talk about highest and best use, I mean, that's a that's critical in in the analysis. You know, I've never been a huge fan. I've never been a huge fan of the cost approach as a standalone approach for market value opinions. Correct. That's just me. I've, I've just never been a real big fan of those. And, and I rarely do. Uh, however, analyzing cost is critical. I mean, how do you get your opinion of highest and best use unless you do a proper analysis of cost? Right. And so what we're finding, um, uh, certainly in the Nashville market, is a lot of folks are buying buying properties and they're, they're buying nice houses and they're tearing them down. Right. Because the land is worth more than the improved value. Correct. So they'll, they'll tear down the house. They call them tall and skinnies. <laughs> they'll, buy mm -hmm. a, they'll buy a house on a lot, tear the house down, remove the improper improvement, and then they'll, they'll possibly build three of these tall and skinnies on, on the same site where the, um, where the prior improvement was. Right. Do you see much of that happening uh, in other parts of the country, Scott? Well, I've got a neighborhood right near where I used to live where there's a, um, a national historic neighborhood built in the 20s, beautiful tutors and co colonials that sell for a million dollars. Same school district across the road, down a block. There's the 1950s, early 50s development with these two bedroom, one bath, 900 foot ramblers. Uh, we call them ramblers up here with a one car garage. Well, I would do an appraisal in there. And when it started, the house that had not been taken care of it was not worth fixing. Um, it was worth 300000 Somebody bought it, tore it down, and put a $500,000 house on it. And now they've got an $800,000 property. It's not in Country Club, which is the name of that district, but it's got everything else. It's got the shopping and the schools, and it's got the right zip code, right? Well, then I'd come back in that neighborhood, and I'd appraise a, uh, uh, the same house, only this thing had been remodeled two years ago. It was beautiful but it was a two bedroom, one bath, one car garage house in this neighborhood. It sold for 300, they tore it down. Right. Even right. when it's in perfect shape, it didn't add enough value. People, not, not all 400 of those houses is worth $300,000 for a lot at one moment in time. But as it, got, as it went along, at least one per month was being redeveloped. And they actually hired a person within the building department to supervise because the neighbors were up in arms. There's construction trucks, there's demolition going on. There's all kinds of noise and racket and safety concerns when, when a neighborhood is, is going through that process. So yeah, we see it up here too. Now, getting back to your comment about not doing the cost approach, I remember I used to say in my reconciliation up until three years ago that the cost approach is given no weight mm -hmm. because of the difficulty of estimating site value and depreciation. Mm -hmm. How can you get to a value if you don't know the depreciation, right? And then the light bulb went on and I realized that, well, wait a minute, if I know the value and I know the site value and I know the cost, then I can get the depreciation and then I can do all kinds of magic knowing depreciation. So, uh, so I had a change of heart about three years ago on that. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to share a screen here real quick, just cause I want to, I want to be cool like you, I think. Uh, so can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay. So the screen I'm showing right now is the uh, Fannie Mae Selling Guide. It is published September 4, 2018. Gosh, that was just a few days ago, wasn't it? Right. September 4, 2018. Folks, you probably ought to get on and look at this stuff on a regular basis because change is occurring in our industry almost daily. So uh, I check this. Uh, I check these sites out on a regular basis. And I don't know if it's, yeah, it's letting me highlight. So it's talking about Fannie Mae does not require the cost approach. Now, again, sometimes you'll have clients that say we want the cost approach, right? But look right here. If you are doing the cost approach, Fannie Mae is very clear. The reliability of the cost approach depends on valid reproduction cost estimates, proper depreciation estimates, and accurate site values, accurate site values. So, you're uh, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, 
but you better have some kind of support for that opinion. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Right. Uh, Scott, we've got some other questions coming in. So let's try and get to as many of those as we can. The clock is ticking kind of quick, but uh, let's see if we can get to some of these other questions. This is a uh, question from William. William says, also, if the site value is a large factor of value when using the sales comparison approach and sales are being sold at lot value or a lack of remaining economic life in a home slash market area. And I think we, we've kind of talked about that. That sounds to me like the highest and best, highest and best use issue we were talking about. Right. Now, now the highest and best use is um, a development lot. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you know, many times we'll we'll go look at a property and we realize, hey, I think the typical buyer would be somebody that's going to buy this property, tear down the improper improvement, right, right, in order to ready the site for its highest and best use. So, you know, we may be looking at a scenario where um, it's land value less demolition cost. Right. Uh, here's another uh, question. Some of these look like they're comments, but. Uh, this is from Michael. Michael says, to do the extraction method, you need to know the effective age. To get Correct. the effective age, you need to know the site value. Right. Extracting back like what we are talking. Are you applying any other technique to get the effective age? Well, it does sound on the surface like circular reasoning. And uh, in the course that we're working on with appraiser e-learning, we're going to be talking quite a bit about logic. Now, the counterpart to circular reasoning is the scientific method. And I would say that once an appraiser that's competent has looked at the contract, they've looked at the house on MLS, they've developed a comp pool, they've been in the neighborhood, examined the house, looked at the comps, they are ready to um, have a tentative value in mind, a hypothetical value, okay? So now we're gonna test the hypothesis. That's just the scientific method. And then we're going to revise the hypothesis if the data points that direction. So my approach when I do one of these is I go into the neighborhood with this hypothetical value. I then use another one of my applications to give me the adjustments if that land, if that value is correct, if that site value is correct, if that um, if that market value is correct, and it'll give me adjustments that I can use in the grid. And then it'll tell me if I'm close, if I need to go up or down. Um, and because the site, the website's interactive, I can change the value according to what the market tells me with the adjustments I've developed, change the site or the, uh, the value and get new adjustments and do it again. So it's iteration. So I guess we circle back around as many times as we want, um, kind of using a scientific method of hypothesis, test the hypothesis, change the hypothesis. But but he's correct. Um, effective age is pretty much, um, that is the key to doing the, uh, the extraction method. You have to know that. Scott, on the, uh, so at the beginning of the broadcast, you said um, that you are a practicing appraiser. So you're a certified right. residential appraiser and you're, you're, I mean, you're an author, you're an educator, you, you speak regularly and, and you have a software company that you uh, provide. But at the end of the day, you're just one of us, right? You're still exactly. a practicing appraiser. You're still going out, measuring houses, uh, taking photographs, taking comp photos, developing credible opinions and delivering them to your clients. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. So as a, as a fellow appraiser or appraisal practitioner, as I would say, uh, what percentage of the assignments that you're currently working on, do you, would you say that you do a uh, comparable sales analysis for, for vacant lots uh, the allocation method or the extraction method, which, which one, if any, uh, do you do more often than the other? Well, on my website, I've got a section that talks about reporting where I show the example, but I'll try to recite it for you. Uh, in the cost approach, I state that there are X number of sale, recent lot sales in the neighborhood. It might be zero. It might be four. And then I'll say the assessor's, uh, opinion is two is, um, 60. Um, and then I'll say, well, if you apply the assessor's land to value ratio to the median value in the neighborhood, it's 80. 
And then I'll say the opinion of site value is developed with most weight on A, the site sales if they're out there, or B, the um, applying the assessor's land to value ratio to the meeting in the neighborhood, which I think is a pretty, pretty close way to do it. Now, another way is to take the average comp sale price, just the sale price, and apply the assessor's land to value ratio to those prices. Because in my opinion, the assessors are better at knowing the ratios than they are at knowing the actual numbers. I think they're a little behind the market on the actual values of the land, but I think they're pretty close on their land to value ratios. Uh, so again, it's just a starting point. You're looking for all the data you can, and then you use your inductive reasoning ability, um, your years of experience to um, decide if the site sales make most sense or if that it's kind of a simplified allocation method mm -hmm. or um uh just you know here's what the assessor said so you're you're doing a little combination of both then and, right. and 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 before i go further i'd just like to remind viewers at least my opinion you got to be careful using the assessor's numbers um, right. uh you know it depends on where you're what jur jurisdictions you're in and, and and what's going on in your own market uh, sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not so great. Right. And uh, in certain areas, you got to keep in mind as well that um, those are those are done sometimes every four or five years. Right. So, you know, if if the assessor developed that opinion and probably using a mass model, mm -hmm. uh, if they developed them four years ago, that might not be really reflective of what's going on today. And each each area of jurisdiction is going to be, you know, vary. Um, but anyway. I forgot one. Can I say one more? Sure, you bet. Go okay. Ahead. So first of all, it's I look for land values and I state my results of that. I even put um, a screen capture of the sales, maybe summarized on a one one line per property thing. Then it's the what the assessor says, just because that's a point of information. Mm -hmm. Then it's the assessor's ratio applied to either the median value or if this house is expensive or cheap. Maybe it's the average value of the comps because it's not a median price house I'm doing. Um, and then the fourth one, I will use the allocation method. And that's for cases when I know that the land to value ratio is going to be hard to believe by the bank. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm in that neighborhood where they're doing the teardowns, there are $400,000 houses near there that have $300,000 lots or $200,000 lots. And now you're reporting a 50% land to value ratio without any waterfront. Right. So, so it's a good way to have support and say, well, here's what it is, guys. It is 50% land to value ratio on this smaller house in the hot spot of town. Sure, sure. And I understand there's a reconciliation process sure. that you go through with that. Uh, what's interesting is what have you have you done this just just for fun? You know, I know a lot, a lot of appraisers <laughs> like to analyze, right? So, what would be interesting to me is if you had a had a an example where, and maybe you've done this already, where you have uh, some properties that have adequate land sales, right? So we could mm -hmm. do a try and do a a paired sales analysis on on just comparable lot sales and then do an extraction technique on that on that same property and just see when we get into the reconciliation you know how those how those line up or do they right. not line up have, right. you, have you played around with that yet or i i haven't done it just uh, as a study in a neighborhood but I'm, I'm thinking of one other thing to include as a kind of a caveat it's very important to have the effective age accurate it's also obviously important to have the cost accurate. Sure, sure. And and when you're talking about new construction, if you try to extract value from a new construction property, um, as we talked about earlier, there's entrepreneurial incentive. Sometimes those builders have a 30% markup. Sometimes they have a 10. So they're going to vary from the cost book. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've realized and I tell people the reason that if you do the cost approach new and you've got a new house, the reason that the uh, the cost approach is different than what the builder sold the house for is because the builders don't use the cost book. <laughs> they just go out and sell it for as much as they can. And in fact, the cost data services use the builders, right? And it's a survey of builders to develop the cost manual. And that survey result is a, a, a bell-shaped curve. And they take, they take the middle of that curve and that's the number they publish. And some builders do it for more and some do it for less. 
So um, we do have an application that takes that into account. We call it Solomon Cost New, where it, it compares what the book says the house should be worth and what the builder actually built it for. And then it gives you a percentage to show you how close that builder is um, to what the market or what the book says he should be. Right. But great. that's a, a roundabout way of saying, be careful if you're doing it with new construction. I, I think builders buy lots and multiples and they sell the houses one at a time. So I, I think there's a lot of profit in the land for a, a, a development uh, uh, neighborhood. Right. And, you know, I, I know this is off topic just a little bit, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. Uh, we've, we've got a few minutes left and, and I've got some other questions for you, but uh, your uh, your software will also I mean, the, the big the big kicker with that is, is that you to support your adjustments, not just right. for land, value, but but for other items. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you can extract uh with depreciated costs for for your adjustments in other areas okay well the the, the basic idea is that we want to show people that the buyer didn't pay 250 for the house they paid 50 for the land and 200 for the house mm -hmm. and now we can benchmark that 200,000 we can say well it costs 400,000 to rep or to replace that house so they're actually paying 50 for the land and 50% of value or 50% of cost for cost. the house. So right. if the if the garage is $10,000 and they're paying 50%, they're paying it's a $5,000 garage adjustment. And that's kind of a tentative adjustment because we're assuming that depreciation impacts every cost category equally, which we know isn't true. So right. we've got a little way to again use our inductive reasoning to kind of tweak those because there's different economic life from different components in the house. But, but that's the essence of it is we want to show the percent of cost new the market's paying for the house. And then we apply that percentage um, to components like a bathroom or a garage or a deck or GLA or a basement or basement finish. Uh, I think we've got 12 different features. 12 different, 12 different areas of units of comparison. To, for right. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, William just uh, made a comment, and William says the more competition there is in an area, the closer they, the builders, will be to the ten percent markup. Just a contributory comment. Thank you, right. William. Thank you, William. I would say that's probably true. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you know, uh, it's all a supply and demand, isn't it? And uh, and uh, competition uh, obviously is one of our principles. Uh, there's another comment here, Scott. Do you want to explain the scientific method? Is, what the scientific method is? Okay, this yeah. is this is the going back into the Enlightenment in Europe. Okay, <laughs> where they, um, people started. It's it's not that we trust science in the conclusions that science has published. We trust the scientific method, and that method is to make some observations, develop a hypothesis like uh, water runs downhill or you know whatever the hypothesis happens to be the house is worth 250 um, and then we test the hypothesis in in ways that are reasonable for each situation and then if that testing um, revises the hypothesis we change it and then we test it again it's just an iteration process and that's why a science book written 50 years ago will be different than a science book written today it's not that science is infallible, but the method is really good at, at getting to the truth. And no matter what, you know, whatever, whatever you're counting out there. So uh, Matt just asked, uh, where is Matt? There it is. Um, effective age. Uh, are you aware of any methods? software that can help the appraiser develop the effective age this is matt's question other than jo george dale's effective age de right. decomposition model are you aware of any other methods software that can help you develop effective age well i i keep it really simple in my brain um the 1004 itself assumes the uh the age life method and Diana Jacobs made a comment on one of your broadcasts yeah. that helped me a lot when she said that, you know, when we look at um, depreciation in a house, if we're doing effective, 
do, using effective age as a percentage of economic life to be the depreciation. Um, the effective age is not just physical deterioration. It includes external and functional. They're all rolled into one. Um, all of those are included in the appraiser's estimate of effective age. So I've heard people, or I've read in articles where people will say, and my boss used to tell me, you walk in the house and you develop an opinion of how old it appears to be. And that's only part of that depreciation. There's um, all kinds of factors that go into effective age. It's not just physical depreciation. You know, uh, the, the easiest way for me to describe uh, effective age is back when I was working out all the time and, you know, I ran a couple <laughs> of half marathons, I did a triathlon, I felt pretty good, I was about 180 pounds. Uh, if somebody asked me how old I was, Scott, I'd always give them my effective age as opposed to my chronological age. Sure, <laughs> so, right. so, so that's what we're looking at there. Uh, we've got some other questions coming in, but we're, we're, we're running out of time. So, uh, I'm going to ask that maybe we can kind of get back to those folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Scott, in the last few minutes that we have here together, uh, where are you going to be next? I know you travel around a little bit. Sometimes you, um, you uh, present. Uh, where, where could someone find you if they want to meet you in person? Well, this is probably um, pressure. You know, I'm, I'm applying a speaker pressure here. <laughs> but, but whoever is in charge of that um, meeting coming up in April, I'm going to ask if I can at least... Uh, be up there with you and you can ask me questions and I can answer them. Or if you'll trust me, I'll just get up there with my uh, uh, software and show how it works. Because at the last show, I mean, uh, CoreLogic had an eight hour class on depreciation and they use their software the whole time. So I'm not shy about doing that in a public setting as you know, some people would call it a sales pitch, but um, uh, also in the course that I'm writing with you folks, I'm showing how to do this in Excel. It, it doesn't have to be done with anybody's proprietary software. It's um, it's just a matter of knowing ratios and being able to extract something I call marginal cost from cost data, and then you're on your way. Do you have a name for that that course coming out? Um, I think it's going to be, well, I'm not sure. The depreciated cost class is how Ben and I talk about it. Okay. Um, and, and just to let our viewers know, uh, Scott's kind of let the cat out of the bag here. So uh, Scott is, is working on a course, and, and uh, we hope to be able to offer that through uh, Appraiser eLearning as an online format. I might be offering some of them live in, in a handful of states. Um, but, the, you know, this is all just brand new. Scott's done a great job of writing this. And it's, it's not... It's not for you to rush out and buy his software. I'm sure he'd be tickled to death if you do, but but the the course is to provide you with the tools you need to help you be more effective. And as he just said, that you can do a lot of these techniques right in an Excel spreadsheet. And I think you've got some videos out there, Scott, don't you, on uh, how you can simply do some stuff on Excel. Well, one of the last segments I recorded uh, in the course, it's talking about automation. How do you do this, all this number crunching? So we're just uh, assuming that people don't know a thing about Excel. And in 11 minutes, I'll take them from what a cell is to um, what marginal cost is and how to apply an, a depreciation rate to the marginal cost to get an adjustment. So I know it's, it's 11 minutes long. I don't know if you have time for that, but I think um, Ben's got it. Ben, if you can start that video, I mean, we don't have time uh, to run the whole thing, but if you can start it and maybe we just give a little little tease or a little snippet, if you will. Right. It's just kind of the spirit of what that class is. Basic grid. First, we will build a paired sales calculator. Open a new worksheet and label cells, outline and fill as follows. We will bring data in MLS to make. All right, I think he's. he's and fills to your worksheet below your paired sales calculator. Again, if your cost of data does not provide dollars per square foot, enter the total amount in E10. Do the same for the low bracket GLA in C11 and D11. Look like this. So what we're doing there is showing that the logic 
that it, that we use doing um, paired sales is the exact same logic behind depreciated cost. In one case, we're looking at the change in a factor like GLA. If the GLA changed 400 feet between the perfect pair and the cost changed um, $1,600, then we'd know we had a 400 foot adjust, $400, you know, whatever that, whatever that math works out to. And you can do the same with cost data. You can compare the cost at one quantity to the cost at a different quantity, subtract, divide, and you'll get what I call marginal cost, which is the cost of one more unit of production uh, in financial accounting. And then if you apply depreciation to that marginal cost number, you'll get an adjustment and, and they work surprisingly well. Very good. Well, Scott, thank you so much for being here today. And guys, that's that's a video that's going to be uh, embedded in the course. Ben was moving it around a little bit so you could kind of get different uh, different ideas of the screenshot, but it, it'll be real nice and smooth <laughs> when you watch it. Uh, and that's something that you could do at home on your own computer on, on Excel. It, no special tools or, or nothing you have to buy. If you've got Excel, you can you can load it and and utilize the tools within your computer. Uh, Scott, I, I want to thank you for being here today. It's always great to have you on. I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. I think maybe we can uh, talk to the powers that be and, and maybe maybe figure out at least some sort of platform you, uh, platform for you at Axe. Uh, that is the appraisal uh, conference and trade show out in uh, Salt Lake City at the beginning of April. We'd love to have our viewers show up for that as well. You'll, you'll be getting more information about that coming up. Uh, thank you again, Scott, for being here. And if, any, if anyone wants to reach out to you directly, tell them one more time how they can get in touch with you. Well, my email is S-C-U-L-L-E-N-2, the number two, at Comcast.net. Or um, there's an info at Solomon Appraisal. I believe there's a place that you can contact us on our website, which is uh, SolomonAppraisal.com. Very good. Thank you again for uh, being here, my friend. I look forward to seeing you in the future and talking to you soon. I'd like to thank you to all our viewers that participated today. We hope to see you again next month when we have another special guest. Don't forget to subscribe. And the reason I'm telling you, I, I, I can't stress enough, we've got, a, uh, we've got a really special guest coming up for a special webinar. It's, it's going to be in addition to our regular monthly webinar. I'm not going to tell you who she is. Whoops, I just kind of already gave you a leeway there. I'm not going to tell you who they are or who they work for, but it's going to be exciting. It's going to be uh, informative. And it's going to be talking about changes that are just right around the corner in the appraisal profession. And boy, things are going to be changing. There's no question about it. Uh, thank you for watching. If you'd like to be a guest or if you know someone that you'd like to have on, if there's a topic you'd like to have on, please get back to me again. Thank you, Mr. Scott Cullen. Appreciate your time and, uh, and for you being here today. My name is Brian Reynolds. This is the Appraisal Report webinar. Thank you very much and have a great day. All right.